We will talk about an exhibition we've organized in New York, uh, in the Guggenheim Museum. And in this uh, presentation, Samir and I will give an introduction to give context to what we did. We will then switch to uh, Africa and uh, talk to Linda Gichuya and Etta Madete. Uh, then we'll go to America and talk to Matthew Mazzotta. And then finally we end in the Netherlands with uh, Lenora Ditzler. Uh, and after each of you have kind of presented uh, your, uh, your chapter, uh, we stay together and have a kind of discussion uh, for maybe 15 minutes. And after that, we are kind of meeting uh, questions of the public. Yeah, so let's uh, start with the uh, presentation. So as uh, Rem mentioned, we worked on the, uh, uh, the exhibition called Countryside the Future. Uh, this opened last February in uh, the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Um, and unfortunately, due to COVID, had to close after three weeks, uh, but fortunately uh, is reopening in October, uh, October 3rd, uh, actually, in, um, in the same uh, museum. And the museum uh, will show the exhibition until February next year. And in this exhibition, you'll see quite a lot of um, media, um, not only text, but a lot of films. Uh, archival material like photographs uh, that we have gathered um, uh, in the course of uh, five years and designed as an exhibition. Um, together with the exhibition, we also worked with um, uh, a number of collaborators on a uh, report uh, in which uh, each of them uh, reports uh, on a personal level on some of the topics that they uh, have researched. Uh, basically, um, what I wanted to understand uh, is what happened in the last 100 years in the countryside. You see on the left a picture of three Russian women. They are for, clearly from the countryside. Uh, they have coordinated costumes and they present proudly some of the production uh, of their labor. Uh, and you can see or guess that this is a more or less stable and traditional uh, environment. On the west, uh, on the right, you see an image uh, of current countryside and current agriculture. And you see that this is an agriculture actually without ground, uh, without daylight, and where you see that technology plays a, a massive role. And also that actually large areas are kind of being produced by relatively few people. So you could say we wanted to understand this shift. An important incentive for the show has been a uh, statistic that the UN developed and launched in 2007, where they said or registered that more than that 50% uh, of mankind at that point lived in cities and that the other 50% was stay, stayed behind in the countryside. The, the assumption is that the urbanization will uh, increase dramatically and that by 2050, perhaps 70 or 80% of mankind lives in cities. And we thought that would be uh, pretty dramatic because it would mean that uh, the number of people that now live in the countryside would be halved. And you can imagine how, what a massive transformation that would be. This is another uh, drawing of the United Nations in 1980. 1950, you could say that very few uh, countries or continents were largely urban. America was urban, Europe was urban, Australia and Japan were urban, but uh, more, most of the world was uh, agricultural. And now in 2050, uh, everything is red. And that means fundamentally every civilization or the entire global civilization will be urban with few exceptions. But actually this doesn't really mean that the whole world will be turned into a city. On the contrary, right now 2% of the world is covered in cities. And what it really means is that the countryside uh, will be uh, much less densely inhabited than it is now. And in order to understand 
what the uh, impression of that will be. We looked at different locations in the world and revealed this, different aspects. We looked at permafrost, which is melting in the north of Russia. We looked at China, which is one of the few uh, political systems that has a, uh, a policy for the countryside. We looked at the flows of immigration and the effects of immigration uh, in Africa and Europe. We looked at uh, agriculture in the Central America and we looked at Africa. What we are looking at is very different narratives in each of those. Some of them are optimistic, some of them are dramatic. Uh, and what we chose these uh, narratives uh, in with the hope that uh, together they really present uh, an overall picture of what is going on in the world right now. By looking at so many different places in and distributed over so many different continents, uh, we inevitably uh, also draw a picture of the effects of global warming on the world right now. Uh, right now, it's already very serious uh, and it's not difficult to imagine that it will become much more serious in the future. And in that sense, the whole exhibition is a very strong incentive to uh, take this issue perhaps more seriously than any other issue. Um, the 20th century was um, the era of mega engineering, uh, you could say. Uh, climate, uh, uh, climate change, food security, uh, and economy uh, were all drivers uh, of large scale plans. Uh, designed by politicians uh, from different nations. And although these regimes were uh, very different, um, uh, a lot of countries actually studied each other's plans, uh, leading to sometimes similar approaches or interventions, uh, such as the shelter belts in the US um, and the shelter belts um, in the former Soviet Union. Um, but what is clear from, from uh, this uh, brief overview that we made for the show is that, um, that today's uh, climate and food challenge uh, require uh, perhaps uh, another round of serious engagement uh, on the part of um, uh, the politicians uh, to involve in the countryside. Um, so agriculture itself uh, went through a, um, a massive evolution. Uh, this is farming uh, in the Soviet Union, um, uh, a collective uh, activity orchestrated uh, where men and women worked uh, very hard together under um, hard physical conditions. This is uh, farming in today's Qatar, uh, which is almost a kind of laboratory setting uh, where large scale farming uh, requires uh, people to wear hazmat suits and not to infect themselves or, uh, or animals. Um, finally, another, another uh, case uh, showing this massive transformation of, of agriculture uh, globally is uh, China, where uh, farming um, uh, uh, through the uh, through under pressure, let's say, of social media, um, accelerates uh, uh, in a kind of virtual uh, form of, of, of farming, where uh, the farmer and consumer communicate directly um, uh, on a live stream. Um, we also looked uh, uh, an intensely in Africa. Uh, Africa is uh, perhaps one of the most uh, animated uh, uh, sites in the world uh, right now. Um, and what we documented is uh, a, a place or places where there is a collusion between, for instance, uh, a new train that is uh, built by the Chinese as part of the World and Belt uh, Initiative. Uh, it's a train on pilotes, so that supposedly African life can continue uh, underneath it, uh, unmolested. We had the privilege to work with students from Nairobi University that uh, where we went together uh, on a trip with a train uh, to Voy, uh, more or less the heart of Kenya. And what you see here uh, in terms of raising hands was um, when I asked the question, are there any of these architectural students uh, that 
in the typical condition would be kind of focused on the city and would see their career as taking the place in the city were actually um, willing or interested or could imagine themselves uh, in the countryside uh, and could imagine the countryside as the focus uh, of their career. And basically that is a kind of very uh, crucial uh, underlying ambition of this exhibition. What we want to see is if we could avoid the prediction of the UN, the, the kind of 80% of mankind living and collected in, in huge cities, uh, cities of uh, 20, 30, kind of 40 million, and uh, at the expense of the countryside that would become kind of more and more empty, and whether we can imagine a more distributed, uh, more uh, uh, um, more inhabited countryside where uh, cities would never necessarily have a kind of enormous size but where uh, you could uh, enjoy at the same time the qualities of urban life and also the qualities of rural life. Um, there are certain places in the world where that will be absolutely out of the question and places that will be where there will be no inhabitants left. Uh, here you see a picture of Japan, in Japan near Fukushima, you see a huge uh, robot testing field where the Japanese are testing the possibility of maintaining their country in the absence of a pop rural population by, with robots. Robots that will uh, maintain roads, robots that will maintain tunnels, robots that will uh, maintain uh, infrastructure, but also robots that will maintain monuments, robots that will maintain nature. And uh, so what we will, what you will see is that not a kind of equalization of the world, but uh, a, a world that consists of many kind of radically different uh, situations. You can very easily also imagine a kind of um, integration, a physical integration of man and machine. Uh, in the case of the Japanese um, uh, farmers, where uh, the aging population of Japan uh, asks for a kind of creative ways of maintaining and managing uh, the, their farms. So in this uh, case, um, a, a, a farmer uses an exoskeleton uh, to enable him um, to still uh, perform his kind of duties on land. And um, as a result, this show kind of culminates into two models um, that basically um, are the only two models or, or uh, currently studied um, that uh, mankind can use for its survival. Um, one, um, one theory is called half earth where uh, mankind retreats from nature and, and gives back nature to nature um, uh, in order to form a kind of pristine nature and to preserve at least 50% of earth um, uh, for nature. And you could say that uh, man that has retreated from nature uh, will only um, occupy uh, cities or cultivated areas, um, leading to a super city a condition and a super nature condition. <clears throat> the other theory or the other strategy is called shared planet, where um, this proposes a kind of hybrid of um, uh, 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 nature and, and civilization in a form of, in a kind of collaboration that uh, uses indigenous uh, strategies combined with uh, innovative technology. And this, as a result, will have a kind of super Earth. Uh, I want to end with uh, agriculture again and, and with the kind of issue of large or small scale. It's clear that uh, uh, to survive, large scale will be necessary here and there, but it will not be uh, inevitable. And uh, here you see uh, another kind of picture of um, highly artificial agriculture in the Netherlands. But uh, there is also some kind of new thinking that uh, Lenora will kind of present uh, later, where the kind of suggestion is that perhaps we can move away from large scale with all its fertilizer, all its kind of poison 
and all its deterioration of the ground and maybe switch to other configurations of agriculture that are either bands or, as you will see, even smaller uh, entities. Uh, and that you, in those conditions, can kind of also kind of return to earlier philosophies of farming, where different species kind of reinforce each other uh, and therefore uh, simply create a kind of more healthy, sustainable uh, environment. Um, and what has been fascinating for me, uh, according to uh, Lenore, that this plan would kind of yield to this kind of result. Uh, I'll have her talk about it. But for me, this kind of really represents uh, perhaps that uh, we will need some kind of plan, uh, some kind of planning, maybe a different kind of planning uh, to um, basically um, not only not to put it in apocalyptic terms, but to work uh, and collaborate with the earth in a kind of more productive way. I would now like to uh, shift to Africa, to Linda and Etta. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, my colleague Etta and I are part of the University of Nairobi team. <clears throat> that collated and collected information about the Kenyan countryside. And just to tie um, the theme of the Kenyan countryside and its outcome with the theme of this session on the future remains unwritten, I think an interesting question then becomes what and where are the building blocks of this future and in what proportions and sizes uh, to, to bring about that transformation that we all envision for this future? especially the, the, the new world that you're talking about by 2045, and in order to bring out that transformation. And, and talking about the future and Africa in particular, its proportions and its countryside cannot be ignored, given that currently globally, um, 97 to 98% of land mass is not uh, in urban areas. So, um, what this countryside exhibition and our processing was, was to find out what is happening in this 98% of land, separate from the urbanization process and <clears throat> in our growing cities and towns and urban centers. And could the keys to the future be actually locked in these countryside processes? So what you find um, in the East African countryside exhibition is we attempted to map out the current existing forms of the Kenyan countryside and through which then we are able to give a very high level window into what the future holds for East African. And uh, my colleague Etta will now take you through quick highlights of what we found out in this particular exercise. Uh, thank you, Linda. And I think uh, one thing that I noticed in um, the earlier presentation by Rem and Samir is that in 2050, the UN predicts that Kenya will still be green and not just Kenya. Generally, the East African countries are still green and I completely identify with it because if you ask me where I'm from, if anyone in Nairobi comes and asks me where I'm from, I say I'm from Western Kenya. I don't say I'm from Nairobi. And many Kenyans don't identify Nairobi or urban areas as their homes. There's an ancestral roots that we, we, we con con connect to. Um, and for me, it's Western, it's not even Western, it's Vihiga, Gisambai. That's where my family's from, that's where I go. And I feel completely torn because of the pandemic. I haven't been home in 10 months. Um, and in a normal, typical year, I'd go home four or five times a year. And home is not down the street in my flat, which is sort of um, in an urban dense area. Home is the lush green fields of Gisambai. Um, and that's why I, I, I completely agree and concur that the countryside is not somewhere that we are over idealized. Mm -hmm. And you find that the, the unique story in the East African context may not be able to be extrapolated to the whole of Africa. For every single country, the people have different connections to the countryside. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting investigation to see how different it is. But in terms of generalization, Deborah Potts did make, an, did make an, um, a declaration that the urbanization rate is not happening as fast. Um, and that's very true because you can see here this 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 idea started as a conversation. We were just discussing around the table what else is happening in this other place around Kenya. In the map there on the left, you can see 
that we started highlighting all these spots in the non-urban areas where people have congregated up, innovations have spurred up. Um, and the idea is that you can see here on the left there, there's the UBI, the largest universal basic income experiment that is happening in Western Kenya. Um, the, at the very north, you have Kakuma refugee camp where it's no longer seen as a spot of despair. The youth are turning it into a whole city. In fact, the refugee camp is actually much bigger than some of our urban centers right now. On the top right, on the top right there, you have Garissa. And there you have a huge solar farm that is powering 10% of Kenya's power. Turkana so, uh, wind energy farm is also coming up and that is also providing renewable energy to the area. In fact, 80% of Kenya is powered by renewable energy projects that are located in the countryside since the 1930s. Um, you also have along the coast, some, some very interesting taglines. The, the pink there is the connection of the old British railway and now the new Chinese railway, almost experienced as a new neo-colonialism it's like we are, we are being recolonized but in a different way in our own terms um so it's a conversation that is ongoing and that is becoming fascinating as it goes you have there the garissa solar farm that we i just spoke about that is completely transforming how the countryside <coughs> will look in the future um and and here we have um the sote hub in Voy, as uh, rem had mentioned earlier you think that this is a hub somewhere in a, in a tech savvy urban center but it's not the greatest innovations that are winning awards all over the world are coming from rural um, tech hubs who are harnessing the power of technology to bring out ideas that can only be sort of conceptualized in the countryside format. Um, of course, um, agriculture is not left behind. The number of tech innovations and agri-tech solutions that are coming up is reshifting the way that people are thinking about farming. My peer group do not think of farming as something that is sort of backwards. In fact, I basically have a farm already in the countryside, which I sort of, I, I check in on um, virtually and, and I send money money across via M-Pesa. So everything is already connected um, as you speak. And here's an image in Voy as well. And as I said, the youth and the people in the countryside no longer think of it as a village. They think of it as the space where they'll be able to create and reinvent themselves. Um, and the, the, the different connections like the border borders, um, which are which connect the system is no longer bicycles, no longer um, manual systems, it's very automated systems. Um, and um, you never forget that even in the countryside, football teams are just as important. Um, here, this is Refugee. This is a fashion house that started in Kakuma refugee camp and their models are traveling all over the world. So the idea is that actually the opportunities are spreading out from the urban centers. And the reality is even in Nairobi, Linda, you can even agree, mm -hmm. is that many people don't actually live in the center. People take, live in the outskirts of the city just because of the, um, the density and the congestion, which is no longer seen as a necessity for employment. Um, another key thing that is really galvanizing the countryside opening up is the connections that we're making. So here we have M-Pesa, which is the world's fastest and largest money transfer network that can actually be done on a GSM phone. A GSM phone is a phone that doesn't even get internet, but I can transfer funds across the entire country and people will receive it. Beyond that, I can own an M-Pesa shop and transact. So it has completely broken down the institutionalized financial systems which had formalized and made cities sort of like the, the place to be. And now I can actually trans transact, transfer, transport all over the, the country. So right there is actually a bank, um, as well as the net transport network that is connecting everywhere. And even these that you're seeing here, it's very creative what you can transport on a border border, which is a basically a motorcycle um, system. But right now, these border borders are actually on Uber. So you can actually order an Uber border border in the middle of nowhere and get to where you're going. It's not just Uber, you can also get an Airbnb um, and it's no longer seen as the cities where the high end things ha happen. Like I need to go to a mall to get a good coffee. In reality, <coughs> the countryside is completely opening up. Beyond that, the artists and the creatives in the area are also showcasing great innovative or different thinking about what our perception is of Africa and the countryside. Work by Osborne Masharia, um, is sort of reshifting the thinking about what the countryside means. Um, furthermore, there's, th th these are all sort of grown up, bottom up responses. 
But there's also top-down responses that are coming from the government, like the city planting movement, which I love calling it that because it's sort of like the government comes up with great ideas and just throws the cities all over the countryside. But you can see that the idea is that if these are actually actualized, it's like this snake eating into the countryside in a, uh, in a metropolis. But in reality, it, it's when you actually go visit these spaces, it's still just the countryside. So visualization is important. And also our country, our current countryside, like right now, if I ask you, what are you thinking about the Kenyan countryside? You think safari. But in reality, um, it's that the safari or the countryside has become almost a stage for the animals and the conservation movements. And the contradiction is that suddenly the animals no longer seem to be acting like animals. They're almost acting like friends. They're sitting there with you. And you're sort of challenging what, what does that mean in terms of both the half earth and the um, shared planet movement? How do we maintain a pristine natural environment without human infringement, um, but also have spaces to share? Um, so yes, I think in summary, that's just a quick flip through. We had years of research and we've had years of collaboration and it's all there in the Guggenheim. Um, but I think I'll hand it over to you, Linda. What do you think the future is from this research? I, I think, thank you, Etta, for that quick, brief, uh, quick overview on years of work. Um, and for me, this particular exercise, two things to that and, and picking up from all these activities that you've shown happening around the countryside, one is it's almost like a, like a collage. So you have different activities pasted all over the country in different in the different countryside, be it the UBI experiment, the 25,000 acre solar farm, the existing little um, settle, uh, human settlements, remote areas, we have the uh, refugee camps, we have parks, we have city planting. So it shows a uniqueness of the different sections of the countryside that are individually detached. And then you have uh, these integrating networks by that, that, that are linked physically by the infrastructure that is being put up by the government. So we have lots of real, real uh, construction going on and road that links both the urban areas and the rural areas. And we also have these invisible links, especially with the MPESA, invisible links through MPESA and also internet that, that makes this uh, uh, countryside collage really interesting and also impacting on this uh, uh, collage is our social setting. So you mentioned our very strong sense of home and belonging. You, your home being Bihiga, mine being Meru. So we have this interesting uh, sense of home and belonging where in as much as you work in the urban areas, you consider the countryside as home and that frequency of movement in between the urban centers and the countryside has a direct implication on both spaces. So when I want to go to the countryside, I want to carry things urban with me because I need to get access to my internet. So I need internet services there and vice versa. So moving from the rural area back to my, my <laughs> urban area, I want to carry the green with me. Who so doesn't want that? And you can see some in this office. So that forms a very interesting collage. And, and this collage is also impacted by global influences. So in as much as you could um, look at an aerial view and see a village set up, if you look closely, that village house could be an Airbnb and you could see an Uber zooming and out. And also this collage is also impacted by global challenges like climate change and, and food insecurity. And also what also stands out for me is knowing what we know now about the East African countryside and its processes it stands in stark contrast in what we and we imagine our perceptions about it. Because um, I think generally the countryside is viewed as this monolith. That is where agriculture happens. That is where wildlife exists. Uh, that's where we have our forest conservation. That's where maybe we have a huge tract of land. But then what, what is coming out is that there's a generic assumption that these spaces remain static and they need to be protected. Yet, yet they are going through their own um, independent transformation that needs to be appreciated, that needs to be acknowledged alongside um, the urbanization process. And it's through that acknowledgement uh, that then we begin to, uh, to have very targeted solutions, very targeted solutions to these global challenges we are all having, targeted solutions to climate change and, and food security. 
I think those are the main key points for me, Eta. Yes, yeah. me and Linda can talk for hours, but I'll just say we are very optimistic. We are very excited. If I could go to the village right now, I really would. So I'm going to hand it back over to America, and I guess I'll get some questions towards the end. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Great. Well, that was awesome. Um, my name is Matthew Mazzotta, and I'm an artist. Um, I work with communities in their public spaces. I'm actually going to be presenting from Canton, New York, which is in the Northeast, a town of about 6,000 people. So grew up in rural communities and even my family grew up in even more rural, which is 14 houses in a community in Newfoundland. I wanted to share three projects. Um, they were all uh, in the United States and tell the stories of how they were made. This first project starts in Lyons, Nebraska. This is a farm community, 800 people, and it's in um, the middle of the United States. I just want to pause for one moment. Here. There's a phenomenon that's happening across the United States in small towns where there's a, a large, the slow violence of disinvestment has made the vitality of these spaces um, basically has taken away their life. And because of economies of scale, globalization, everything's online. People just cannot sell in these storefronts anymore. They were designed for retail, but now you cannot. And so in these small towns, the commercial is tied to the social. And so this has actually affected the social life as well. So we developed a project called the Storefront Theater. It uses an abandoned storefront to transform Main Street into a movie theater. Screen gets pulled in. This is trying to bring life back into this space that's been designed. As part of my research and development of projects, I start with an outdoor living room. I basically want to get information and I'm an outsider, how do I get it? And so I actually, instead of doing more formal meetings, I bring the meeting right to people. I put it right in public space and anybody who's walking by can come. This is a way to capture the voices of people that usually don't go to meetings or don't feel comfortable or think their ideas matter at these meetings. This is just everybody on the street can say what they want in their own words. But what came from this is one idea was that, hey, we would like to see the social life come back into our town. It's designed, it's in the middle of the town. Can we have this back? The second idea that came out of it, someone, I asked, what's a secret of this town? And someone says, do you know that building right there? It has no, uh, that, that storefront has no building behind it. So I actually, you know, started researching it, found out the town owns it. And then this became the site of our project for the storefront theater. The community got involved and actually with only local talents and local resources, we were able to build this. So it was a reorganizing of the, uh, the local talents. And as we're building a storefront theater, an eccentric postman who makes science fiction movie um, comes into the scene. So I start talking to this guy and he has this recreations of 1950s coffee shops in his basement. He made uh, spaceships. He had all these sets that he had made for himself so he could film movies and have his, the main actor of all his movies was his cat. So that's all these movies are based around um, his cat. However, I wanted to ask, would you ever want to make a film of, with people about the history of the downtown? So I said, Bill, can you write a script that would go, would be called Decades, and it would go from the beginning, the founding of the town, all the way through the narrative arc to the end, right to the present moment where we are now? And he said, yes. So then we opened that up to the community. People came with period clothing, and we filmed and organized all summer to make this movie about the different decades that happened in Lyons. And this is a way to make the history of this um, community visible. People brought their vintage cars, people brought their costumes, and people were willing to participate in this. Now, Lyons Main Street after dark is always empty. However, when the events happen, it fills up with people. And on this particular night, when we had the debut of both the theater and um, the screening of the film, uh, Decades, I saw this moment as a kind of like a call to arms or an activist gesture. It was saying, hey, the slow, uh, you know, disintegration of a downtown is very, it's not perceptible by most people. It just happens every day. But when it gets concentrated into a film, it really starts to get you to think, where are we? 
where are we going and, and what is my part in this whole game? So this was kind of a moment where the community got to see themselves and where they live and how they're gonna move forward. Since the opening, we've had many screenings, musicians have played anti-bullying events, even a prominent Egyptian musician played the Kennedy Center one night and then played Lions, Nebraska the next night. So this has become a hub for also the dialogue between the international as well. So that's, that's one project. That's called the Storefront Theater in Lyons, Nebraska. The next project I wanna show is called Open House. This project is in York, Alabama. It's in the Southern part of the United States and it's a town of about 3000 people. Now, York, Alabama uh, suffers from the white flight that happened years ago when segregation ended and we had everybody integrate into the schools together, share the same pools, there were certain residents in towns that did not wanna see this happen. And they actually moved out of the towns um, and they left their houses in these towns. And one of the things that happened is they owned the house, but they let it fall apart. And so York, Alabama is covered with abandoned houses from people that do not care to take care of them. Again, as part of my research technique, I use the outdoor living room. So we staged one here to get the voices of people, to hear what's on people's minds. And the things that were said to me that were the strongest were that, hey, we don't have a public space where everybody can come together. And the second thing was these abandoned houses are really affecting the look and feel of our town. We'd like to do something with them. So we got a house that was in the middle of the town. Um, we took all the good materials from it and we built a new house. But this new house has a secret. It can physically transform into a hundred seat open air theater. And these events are always free for the public and are coordinated with the community so that they can be in response and dialogue to what the community's needs are. So it could be plays, movies, theater, music, whatever it may be. Open House is a direct uh, response to the lack of public space in York, Alabama. Allowing people to sit together and dream. When the project is folded back up, the pink siding reminds people of the past. When we did the ribbon cutting um, of the project, the mayor came to me and said, you know, this is super exciting. I think I'm gonna hold the next town hall meeting inside of open house. She says, I think this is gonna give new energy. And this is where I started realizing that public space is political. If you do business as normal, you might get some very similar answers. But when you change formats and when they did this, they actually had their discussion about their town inside of this old abandoned house. And I think from that vantage point, it opened up some new dialogues about the future. Hey, where are we? What's our identity? Where are we going? So I was very happy to see that this was utilized in a way that could actually bring people into a new type of mindset, maybe even one that was creative and um, wouldn't be there on the table unless they did this. The last project I'd like to show, this was in Boulder, Colorado. They have um, all these federal labs there. And so someone told me that they had the highest density of climate scientists. I'm not sure if that's true, but I knew there was a lot of research there. So what I did is I worked with many climate scientists and I said, can you give me a list of all the plants and natural resources that will be leaving this area in the next 20, 20 to 40 years due to the changing climate? So I had this list of all these plants um, and resources. And this town is a very foodie town. So there's all these restaurants. And so I asked a number of chefs, I said, could you cook um, meals made of these plants that are going to be leaving this area? So once we had all this food together, um, made of the plants that are leaving this area, we built a table and it's a mobile table and this goes around America. And basically I work with a scientist and a chef every time to prepare meals so that people in their local environment can eat the last of their landscape. And this is more of a framework for a dialogue. It's translating science into an experience. So this table will set up, there's music at either end, and then people come down and they 
They sit at a, a free um, dining experience. The only thing that has any information is a menu. And this menu in particular, it just shows the different items that are offered today. And these, there's ingredients, but the ingredients of the plants that are gonna be leaving have an asterisk next to them. And they're all defined. Why is it leaving? What's going on in the future? And the conditions that are making that happen. So it's, it's not didactic or political. It's just sit down, eat, and you can you know, read the menu and talk to your neighbor. There's this <clears throat> elegant um, serving system. These copper pipes um, bring, you can see here, this top thing is soup, and then the two um, ones on the sides um, here are kombucha, and they'll go down these lines and people can serve themselves. So once the food is delivered, then everybody can do it. But again, yeah, this is all about translating scientific research into an experience where you actually eat the scientist's work. <clears throat> and obviously the menus will change as the migration of plants move. And I'll, I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you so much. So now we move to Lenore, uh, uh, who is working in the Netherlands. Thanks for having me on this panel, Rem and Samir. My name is Lenora Ditzler, and I am a researcher at Wageningen University, where I'm part of, I should say, a really big, amazing team um, who are working on this concept of pixel farming. Uh, we present pixel farming in the, the countryside exhibition as an alternative, as Rem mentioned, to this more uh, kind of sterile, uh, technical, indoor future of farming um, that we see happening in, in the greenhouses in the Netherlands. So I will tell you a little bit of background theory about what the practice is and kind of an update on what's happened in our projects since the, the show went up. Um, quite a lot has happened. So there are some exciting new developments to talk about. Um, the premise of the work is that we are um, in a position in agriculture where uh, we know that monocultural industrial farming is at its limits of sustainability. Um, and it's widely being acknowledged that new approaches to growing food are urgently needed. And we see this acknowledgement at high levels. Um, recently, most recently in Europe with the European Green Deal, uh, we have these new strategies being published. Um, for example, the farm to fork strategy, which sets incredibly high ambitious targets for farmers um, to improve the sustainability of their systems in just 10 years. And if we're going to ask farmers to meet these targets, they're going to need to adopt new technologies, um, which will mean pretty dramatically changing the way they manage their farms. And we need to provide them with evidence that these changes work and with options for what kinds of new systems um, are interesting. So the work I do at Wageningen, um, as Rem already mentioned, is aiming to support farmers in this transition towards something more sustainable. And our focus in, in the group that I work in is on diversifying monocultural agriculture. And we test a variety of, of new kinds of farming systems to do this. Um, and the one that we present in the show is this idea of pixel farming, which is basically the concept of enhancing biodiversity in an agricultural field by splitting up the field into lots of small patches or pixels, um, and then planting a, a wide range of different crops um, so that they all interact with each other. And you end up with a kind of farming system that looks less like farming and more like nature. You might have heard of strip cropping. Um, this is gaining quite a lot of traction in the Netherlands right now. Um, pixel farming basically just goes one step further by further splitting the strips into smaller squares. And the, the premise and promise, of course, of this system is based on the science that says that diversity works. Uh, it works in arable farming systems um, to improve both agronomic sorry, and ecological outcomes of those systems. This happens through a variety of mechanisms, um, including that plants can resource uh, access resources better. There's increased border effects, which allows them more light to grow. Um, they occupy different niches in the system, and there's uh, an enhancement of biodiversity, which is beneficial. 
So we use this theory of diversity to design and test experimental fields with different plant combinations. Um, and part of that process involves using plant growth simulation models like the, the one you see on the screen now to, do, to implement different design options and explore what the, the outcomes might be and how plants interact with each other in these systems. Um, a big part of getting pixel farming to work is making sure that the plant combinations are beneficial to each other and that they don't compete too much. And these kinds of modeling exercises help us understand those interactions better. So when we design pixel fields, we use this knowledge and we try to maximize those beneficial interactions. Um, Ram already showed a, another version of this map, but this is an example of an, an actual planting plan for one of our experimental trials that we run at Wageningen. And each color number combination represents a different crop type. When you put a plan like that in the field, uh, you end up with something that's not so neat and tidy, um, but looks more like a, a wild thriving ecosystem. So this is one of our, our actual experimental trials in Wageningen. And we have two of these going right now at this site. And we measure a wide range of um, performance indicators, which cover both agronomic performance, productivity, um, product quality, et cetera, um, and ecological indicators like um, crop quality, sorry, soil quality, pest and disease incidents, um, biological pest control, and the, the biodiversity measures. For some indicators like biodiversity, we're already seeing really clear results that pixel farming is beneficial. And for others, it's harder to see what the effect is um, because we have mixed results depending on crops and the seasons. Um, but it's a long-term trial and we're only about halfway through with this. So we're not gonna, we're not ready to draw real quantitative conclusions yet about the overall performance. But I can say in our Wageningen trial, we do see a lot of competition between plants. Um, and we know that we need to focus more of our research attention on what it is that makes good neighbors in a, a, a pixel plot setup. So one of the most exciting developments since the show opened is that we've started a new collaboration uh, with these farmers here in the Netherlands um, on an estate where there's an organic farm. And um, this, is, this is fantastic because it's our first chance to actually try to make pixel farming a reality. So on a real farm, not an experimental trial. Um, this farmer has started growing a half hectare of one and a half by one and a half meter pixels. So if you do some quick math, that's um, over 2000 individual pixels, each sown with something different. And you see the planting plan for just a portion of the field here on the right. Um, this plan was designed following companion planting rules that the farmer himself wrote uh, for 30 different crops. And this is what the field looks like, well, at least a, a couple weeks ago. Um, and what we're seeing here at this trial is incredibly promising. Um, the farmer himself told me a few weeks ago that these are the biggest vegetables he's ever grown in his life. And this is a farmer who's been growing vegetables for over 20 years. Um, and this, it, basically th this trial is performing a million times better than our expectations and better than our experiments at Wageningen. Um, and my hunch is that it's because we're not farmers at Wageningen. So seeing a real farmer try out the system and exceed wildly um, is a really exciting outcome because it, it hints that our scientific theory really is sound and that there is potential. The caveat, of course, is that a skilled farmer is essential for making the system work. And that's probably obvious hearing me say it right now, but it's more regularly forgotten in agronomic research contexts than we agronomists probably want to admit. We're all super excited to see this new pixel farming trial working, um, but of course we're scientists and we want hard numbers. So we currently have a team of really hardworking master students who are collecting and analyzing data from this farm um, and comparing it with what we see at our Wageningen insight to find out um, what factors are leading to the success and uh, help us understand 
better why these vegetables are so huge and how we can improve the design of pixel farming systems. A major challenge you, you might imagine in these systems is labor. Uh, because of how small the plots are and how diverse the field layout is, you can't use normal tractors. And um, agricultural machinery has historically gotten bigger, not smaller. So there aren't really tools on the market that fit the demands of pixel farming. And one option, of course, is to do everything by hand, which may be desirable for some, but for most farmers, it's not really a practical solution. So as part of our research, we're also looking at this question of technology and um, the possibility of robots and automation to make this kind of so-called high resolution farming possible at bigger scales. There are some initiatives that are already happening to try to design uh, robots that will be able to manage these kinds of pixel fields. Um, but for the most part, these technologies follow the kind of monoculture mindset of uh, industrial traditional farming practices um, and don't really work, work well yet. Um, so seeing the slow development of these tools over the course of our research so far, um, we've sort of waffled back and forth about whether robots really are the solution to making the system work and if maybe low tech tools are more in line with the kind of agroecological um, underlying principles of pixel farming. Um, we don't know yet what the solution is, but I, I just wanted to add quickly that I, I read this morning um, that apparently the corona pandemic is really boosting the agricultural robotics scene. Um, so maybe we're going to see an acceleration of these technologies and their development and some more innovative solutions coming on the market soon. So as a, as a final note in our pixel story and the new developments, um, this is brand new work. I wanted to quickly mention that um, things that we're doing now, which is an exciting new phase of the research, um, where we are now going back, we're using the real life experiments um, to obtain data to put back into the plant models for further analysis. So what we're seeing is a kind of new loop happening between um, the real and the virtual of the pixel farming world. And we're really excited to find out what we're gonna learn from um, this new research loop. So that's the report on where we stand now with our pixel farming inquiry. And I think I will hand it back to you, Raman Samir. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank really you. happy with uh, all these uh, presentations. Yes. Uh, that uh, at least kind of showed the diversity and the kind of different perspectives. And also the hopeful perspectives of, mm -hmm. of, of looking at uh, new ways to how to deal with the countryside rather than basically just uh, giving it up. Um, I have a question actually for, uh, for all three of you that you um, um, maybe in the, in the order that we saw your presentations can answer, is um, if we look back at the two uh, options, let's say the two strategies of whole earth and um, uh, or a shared planet and half earth, where half earth means uh, human interaction is, um, uh, is retracted, let's say from the countryside and from nature, uh, and, and mankind only focuses on, on, on urban environments and cultivated areas. And shared planet is this more kind of collaboration between uh, mankind and nature. Um, what would each of your interventions look like in, in each of these two um, uh, strategies? Or, or are they specific to uh, one of the two uh, uh, models? Um, I think, I think from our end, as I mentioned, we are almost already living in a shared planet kind of system because we're always going back and forth. And again, that's to do with our history, with our roots in the countryside. But beyond that, I think what's happening is this leapfrogging that we're doing. Uh, as you mentioned in uh, Matthew's, Matthew's uh, presentation, Matthew said that people are li leaving the countryside. So this idea of people went to the city, they moved to the city, and then they left, and now they're leaving the countryside and going back. But we feel like in our context, what's happening is that that migration is not actually happening. People who are thinking of moving to the city no longer feel the need to. 
So you'll find that actually we are already sharing the planet and this sort of rural to urban migration is a continuous process. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and if I could quickly comment there and, and, and begin on what you talked about the processes. We see that the countryside processes are very closely linked with the urbanization processes. So knowing what we know now about uh, the countryside processes and what we found out and the urbanization process that has been very well documented with the latest uh, statistics about 2050 and the need to industrialize Africa and there are several processes on, on doing that and also the need for preservation and the need to protect the environment, it has to be a shared process. This, these processes are interlinked and in a sense, there is need to systematically see them in one space and as a whole, so that then we can have a very coordinated mechanism of um, having that good mix, the good mix between urbanization, preservation, um, and uh, urbanization, at, at least for Africa and, and its future. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I can imagine that. Um, I, I want to also anticipate the question kind of later. Are we, I, I have a kind of obsession with um, where in terms of culture and where in terms of thinking, uh, let's say uh, attention or the, the emphasis shifts. I think that we've been uh, for a very long time dealing with predominantly Western models. Uh, and I think that uh, you can see a decline of the Western influence uh, everywhere. And I think that, uh, for instance, the interaction between kind of China and kind of Africa could also in part be based that this phenomenon of having a foot both in the country and in the city uh, exists both in Asia and, and in Africa. So not only in China. So um, do you think that eventually the, the whole prognosis of the UN that everyone kind of uh, is uh, concentrating on cities uh, might, be, might be off kind of simply because the rest of the world or other parts of the world don't share that model uh, in, in, in a deep cultural sense? Um, yeah, I, I think I could start on that and, and just uh, highlight two key issues. The, the data uh, that shows um, that by 2050, the, uh, most of the African cities, 50% uh, of the population will be living in cities, gives a perception of mega cities, that mega cities will happen in Africa. And, and that shows on the map that you showed initially of these huge blobs. But when, when you look closely at what is happening on the ground, the, the, the shape and the form of urbanization is quite different because what we found out, and, and that shows really well in the first picture that you showed, is um, because of this, our strong sense of home and belonging, the, 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 the urbanization is taking the form of um, scaled neighborhoods, little neighborhoods forming around and and not in the form of a very central uh, formal urban model, mega city model like New York, where you have all buildings concentrated, but there's this uh, sort of um, broken down neighborhoods and skilled neighborhoods because of that. And the second aspect uh, is there's, there's this perception of development that, that I think sometimes we get into, and you could see from the images uh, shown by Eta, that development is New York. So you have tall skyscrapers, busy people on the streets, uh, uh, glass buildings. But we need to define as Africa, we need to define what development means. What is development in, uh, in uh, the, the, our Northeastern region where you showed, where you showed the, 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 the uh, solar panels? What, what is development? And development that appreciates the culture, that appreciates our culture, that appreciates the environment, and that entire social soup that picks up on border border and, and items happening in the city. Maybe that, that is what we need to define. We need to define um, what is African development. And then, and then the whole scale of what is a form, what form it takes becomes a very key issue. What and, do you think? and I'll also yeah. just add one last thing, mm -hmm. is the actual data itself. The 2019 census came out for Kenya and it found that actually Western Kenya, where I'm from, it's actually the most populated area in the entire country. Because what actually happens is that when you're being counted, you go back home. 
So the fact that Nairobi is not the most populous city is not actually true. We actually go home to be counted. And that means that that's not actually where you live, but that's where you identify with. So the data itself is actually very skewed based on information that is maybe not exactly what's happening on the ground. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. Um, Matthew and Lenora. So let's start with Matthew first, maybe with answering the, the, the question before. Yeah, you know, I have not thought of this. So the shared earth where we're all over or the half earth where we concentrate and we allow nature to re wild or whatever. This is just, you know, going off the cuff. It's the things, it seems a little bit dangerous to uh, concentrate everybody with such a top-down plan. Maybe that can work, I don't know. For me, it seems like the shared planet would be more valuable in terms of our, you know, our culture and diversity of perspectives um, that people do develop in different ways. And that's what makes us so great is hearing from so many different ways and also how people cultivate the land, their relationship with it. If we're able to have more data on how more people are dealing with this planet and able to bring that into the conversation, it just seems like that's gonna be a more robust and rich conversation than to concentrate everybody through a kind of a top-down model. Uh, but that's my first read right now. The only other thing that came was the factory farming. I know that, you know, I live in an area where we had dairy farming. So each small farmer had their thing, but now we have, because of the sharp edge of capitalism, we have factory farming where all the cows are put together, but then you have to, you get to, you have to medicate them because that closeness can be sick. Um, also their way. So I don't know, you know, is this a good idea to concentrate everybody? Um, but that's my first impressions. Lenore? Yeah, well, as you both know, this is a really hot debate in agricultural sciences. Um, and if you were really going to like try to very roughly break down agricultural scientists into two camps, this could be one way to do it. Um, and it in some ways kind of goes along these lines of whether we should be looking to ecology or technology um, for the solutions. I think that, that those debates are linked. And pixel farming falls squarely in the middle. Um, I think it's fundamentally a shared planet technology or approach um, because as I, as I mentioned, the whole idea is to try to make farming practices or create farming landscapes that are as productive as our, our conventional industrial farms, but also produce all these other services that we try to get from nature or that we expect from nature. Um, water cycling, carbon sequestration, biodiversity, all these other things. So in essence, you, you wanna do farming in a way that still feeds us and serves our needs, um, but also acts like nature. Um, and that's what we're trying to do by creating these very, very tiny fields um, and mixing up all these plants in a highly controlled way. But in, in the bigger picture, it's, it's supposed to behave more like nature. Um, yeah, so I, I think that it's more, it's definitely a shared planet technology. And the question is um, what role we want for humans and human labor and farmers and, and the kind of social structures around pixel farming to take in creating the, those systems. And this comes back to this question of, of robots and uh, machines and, and how we, we manage those systems. I want to make um, both uh, a comment and a question. Uh, Samir initially showed uh, a number of politicians who were creating uh, enormous upheavals in their countries over a very long time uh, and uh, to say the least with uh, very mixed results. Some good came out of it but also a lot of uh, very very serious and dramatic kind of problems and issues. Uh, what I like about uh, what we are hearing uh, today is that uh, none of you is kind of talking about uh, plans or none of you is talking about a master plan and everything is more about a strategy and more about a process and a method. Uh, and uh, in that sense, uh, what I think could be very hopeful, uh, but I want to ask you whether you also think it's hopeful that uh, that this these methods uh, in in combination 
uh, basically focusing on smaller scale, kind of focusing not on upheaval, but on uh, kind of in a way extrapolation of good forces that are already there or good thinking that is there. Um, could work in the kind of very short periods we have to uh, avert uh, the, the worst aspects of global warming. In other words, you were saying this is a long term research, but uh, obviously there is no long term to to, uh, to to begin to handle things. Uh, so I'm asking you about the kind of robustness and, and, and the kind of future potential of each of these kind of forms of thinking uh, in terms of uh, averting the worst and, and therefore being the basis perhaps of a genuine optimism uh, and, and, and a kind of real separation of the kind of thinking of uh, running the world or planning the world or uh, uh, manipulating the world uh, in a massive scale. And, and, and I could even add, you know, is there kind of maybe in that sense a kind of feminist dimension to, to this uh, thinking? Rem, are you starting with me with that question? <laughs> or should we go back in our order to Linda and Edda? No, you can start and continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there, there are so many layers to what, what you um, just stated. I'm not sure where to begin with that. Um, but I, I will say that I am optimistic. I agree that the, the sort of timeline that we're working on um, calls for a greater urgency than our experiments are operating at, but that's just a reality of this kind of work. Um, but the optimism comes from the fact that there are um, kind of local innovations happening all over agricultural landscapes around the globe um, that are already promising and they're already working. Um, we're researching this system because we think it has potential to replace really large swaths of industrial farming um, areas and to to replace it with something that is more ecologically benign and productive. Um, but there are already initiatives all over the world to do very similar things um, that come from indigenous practices and, and highly localized traditions, um, which are following very similar principles of biodiversity and inclusion um, and all of these things that we're studying. And the important thing is that we're doing it in an industrial context and that's maybe um, comes back to this question of whether you change the future from the bottom up or the top down. And I think both angles are necessary, obviously. Um, but I also wanna say that, yeah, that we're, we don't expect the system to work everywhere or to replace everything, that, that these localized um, approaches and indigenously inspired practices um, and the little, the farmer groups who are making their own tractor implements to attach to their machines, um, these kinds of workshop settings. There's so many amazing things being created all over the place. Um, and I think that the, the focus needs to be on this localized effort. Um, of course, we can exchange ideas globally. Um, yeah. I didn't answer the part about feminism. <laughs> so maybe I'll leave that to Linda and Edda. <laughs> oh, then um, we'll be here for a long, long time. Yeah, I think what I can do is just mention three points, especially in the unique to the African and the Kenyan context. One is that in Kenya specifically, 80% of the food, for example, is grown by women, but only 1% of the land owned in Kenya is owned by women, 1%. So I think if you're going to transform the countryside from a point of inclusivity, the problem of ownership comes into four. Who makes the decisions is the people who own the land. How the land is still, it depends on who owns it and who takes ownership for it. And the conversation is changing over time. It's to do with inheritance and how women were not allowed to inherit land until only just recently. So I think the feminist question is an ownership question, but I think in terms of the movement, we're making great strides in that. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, as, as you all know, there's a lot of matriarchal uh, societies in Kenyan in the Kenyan tribes. So the, most of the decision making happens and comes from women in the community. So even then it becomes a question of ownership versus who has the voice to make some of the decisions. Um, in another chapter altogether, I'll even begin to say from the sort of the idea that Rem mentioned this sort of master planning, macro planning that comes from the top down that has no effect really at the ground level. 
especially because the population pyramid in Africa is sort of this way. So what actually happens versus what people say is going to happen comes from the ground up. And that's why despite Barclays Bank and um, KCB being around Kenya and in the rural areas for over 100 years, it has never taken track. It's only until M-Pesa started that people stopped hiding money under their beds. And currently, M-Pesa transacts about 150 million US dollars per day, mm-hmm. per day. So it's not about the money, it's about the sort of like, M-Pesa is, is, is ownership. It's about ownership and I get to own it and that sort of transforms the entire notion of, um, of what happens. And the last thing I think I'll mention is the fact that this shared planet concept is something we're living with already. Nairobi city is the only city in the whole world that has a national park. And because of that, sometimes traffic stops because a lion sort of casually strolls along the Langata road or he wants to sunbathe. But the fact is that we wait, we wait for them to sort of, you know, figure it out. Mm-hmm. And this, okay. this tension and this conflict is something we are, we interact with all the time with the new SGR crossing our, um, our national parks and having to contend with that. But the most important thing is that how do we keep these areas pristine? For the first time in over a hundred years, we can actually see the, the, the snow tops of Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Kenya from Nairobi for the first time because of Corona and the fact that people are not polluting the air. So this idea of sharing the planet and also time share of these natural reserves is an important concept to consider. Uh, thank you. I, I don't think I'll belabor on the feminist issue, but I'll pick up on the question you asked, Rem, on uh, from pol- from policies to strategy. So then, what what next, and how how do we actually get things done? As you're talking about from discussion to action, and and I think the biggest question here is to answer how do you how do you make scientifically understood principles decision relevant scientifically understood principles that at a very global level, we have these very high level summit level recommendations that sometimes need to be distilled to to fit into different contexts. Like for instance, the Kenyan countryside is quite diverse and giving a spatially neutral recommendation might not fit in within the same different countryside settings. It might not fit in within the, the different urban settings. So I think the biggest question is how do you make um, scientific information and all these processes, the, the, the countryside processes, decision relevant and decision relevant across so many stakeholders of this space. So make them decision relevant to national government level and, and have, have these recommendations appreciate their value, their value clarification and also um, decision relevant to the multinational agencies that work within the different governments, make it decision relevant to the universities so that then they know what it is that they're targeting, make it decision relevant all the way to the household level where you find we are all working towards the same end. So if it's climate change, both national government, local government, all the way down to all the stakeholders, are working cautiously and and, um, in a very targeted manner to reach this end game. I think that's the greatest challenge we have, um, at least in in, in solving some of these global challenges like climate change and also food security, where you find the decision-making spaces keep varying and dependent on who is in charge and and how do you coordinate such a multi-stakeholder space to reach one target is, is I think, what we need to think more about. Thank you. Uh, Great. Um, Matthew, do, do you want to answer the question as well? I can do it. I'll, I'll try to make it a little shorter. I was just thinking if we're thinking about progress from the macro level, I mean, we have to completely understand that everything is interconnected at this point, from business to technology to climate change. And any of our decisions affect our neighbors and affects other people around the world. And so we must consider the global implications when we make any type of progress um, on the micro level. Um, my whole thing is let's bring everybody to the table. I mean, there's so many people at, you know, living on the planet today and everybody has a unique experience. I think when we incorporate everyone's voice, we're going to have those more robust, long lasting solutions. So I think that we have to be open to listening. Now, this is going to be a global conversation for all countries from here on out and everybody's got to be at that table. So that's, that would be my position. 
Uh, I think that uh, we have a number of questions uh, from the public, and so we would like to uh, kind of really uh, discuss those. So here's the first question for Matthew. Um, and this is a question from Ahmed from Indonesia. Uh, Matthew, what do you think will be the catalyst to revive these small American towns, uh, given that the economic foundations of which they were built on uh, no longer exists? Yeah, that's a, I think that's where we are. So this is a, the U.S. context. These small towns were made by dreamers. People said, hey, we like this plot of land. We're going to start to develop it. Then a grocery store came, then, you know, some goods, and then eventually an opera. These downtowns functioned as the social life, as the commerce, as everything. But on that arc of its story, I think that um, these small towns are being eroded by these economies of scale. They cannot survive with the retail. I think it's going to have to switch over to services and also experiences. And because these downtowns are so much of the identity of a place, I think that artists, um, designers, and architects are going to have to join forces with the community residents and the local government to start going, what's important for us? How do we make the next step? And are we willing to re-enter that dream state that formed the town in the first place? And I think that's the only way these towns can go forward because I don't see that pushing more retail through them is going to work. So I really think this is the moment these towns need imagination. And I think, that, and actually that's, that's, the, that's the organization that we're starting um, and it's starting to push out now. It's called The Main Idea. It's about Main Street in America. And basically that's all it is. It's trying to give a phone call so the community can say, hey, we've lost our vitality. We do not have our public face shining anymore. Can we move forward? I think we need help. The second question is a question for Tula Nora from Ellen in Emeryville, California. In the pixel model, which is brilliant, where the 7 billion humans factor in? It seems that this model is a uh, very human scale. Uh, and how does the biodiversity of humans factor in? Well, thanks for that question. I think there's sort of two layers to that. One is this, um, what I'm reading between the lines is the question of can we feed the population with this kind of technology? At least that's how I interpret the first part of that question. Um, and the, the honest truth is I have no idea. Um, the scientific theory that I mentioned is, is strong that more biodiverse agroecosystems are just as productive, if not more, than our conventional systems. Um, and they deliver these other really essential ecosystem services that allow us to live comfortably on the planet. Um, so I think by the books, this kind of system should be able to feed us and not only feed us, but also um, provide the kind of environment that is actually livable. Um, the second half of that question has, I think, more to do with the diversity of humans perhaps involved in farming. Do you, do you think I'm interpreting that correctly, Ram and Samir? I think you could. Yeah. Could you read me the second half again? Okay. So how does, uh, it seems that this model is a very human scale. How does the biodiversity of humans factor in? Yeah, well, okay, so I, I, I think what you're getting at is the fact that what you see in these photos that I've shown are these small scale fields where one person can stand there and touch all corners of the field and manage the entire thing um, by walking through in a few hours. Um, and maybe the, the issue at hand here is that there are many different scales of farming systems around the world from a, a kind of microscopic section of a hectare to many hundreds of hectares. Um, and I think that this is where this question of, of what kinds of technologies we wanna use in these systems comes into play. And um, what I mentioned in my last answer about uh, needing a variety of technologies and approaches to innovation um, from very simple hand tools to really high tech swarms of autonomous agro robotics. Um, I think that all of those options have potential and which one works will really depend on this, this diversity of human um, capability and desire to interact with these systems. Some farmers want to walk their fields every day and look at every plant um, and feel and smell the soil and they don't like robots. Um, other farmers have told me that actually robots will give them more time to walk through their farms and feel the, and smell the soil and observe their plants. And that actually that takes them closer to nature by having robots. 
Um, so the, there's, you know, people are incredibly diverse and have incredibly diverse relationships to these tools. And I think that the key is not a one size fits all. Um, yeah, reaction, basically. Thank you. Thank you, Lenora. Um, I have a question from John in California to Linda and Etta. Uh, Dr. Linda and Etta, with this new colonization, as you said, on Africa's terms, uh, what are the considerations for cross-border land preservation? And the second part of the question is, are there any specific governance uh, laws or terms for these, um, for the twin goals of preserving the natural resources while fostering a sustainable future? Has the African Union formally established these items yet? Um, I think I'll start with the neocolonialism. Um, there's not much sort of um, fight or like understanding of this sort of idea of cross-border preservation. Um, because as you all know, the main reason that the first the initial British train that crossed the East African plains that went from the coast of Mombasa all the way to Kampala in Uganda, that was meant to just open up the interior of the country to landlocked, landlocked areas or landlocked colonies. And the same thing is actually happening. The main reason that China is sort of starting from the coast all the way cutting across is to access the center of the, of the continent. Um, but the idea is that the so the reason that we're saying it's within our own terms is because we said yes. <laughs> we, 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 we sat down, we signed, we signed um, agreements and we said yes. And we said, you know what, this would also open up our countries. Um, and the idea is that we are meant to become much more a unified East Africa, the EAC, that can be able to, to, to enhance and um, work with this um, preservation. And the second on in terms of um, the, the preservation, sorry, the second one was on the sustainable, if the African Union has worked on a way of working with the sustainable frontier, sorry, can you repeat the second one? Yeah, so are there any specific governance laws or terms for the twin goals of preserving natural resources while fostering a sustainable future? And has the African Union formally established these items yet? I think I think I'll, I'll go there and, and just uh, answer it at a very bad's eye view, um, given that the AU just set up and they're still developing systems. But in general, uh, when you're talking about preservation, uh, the countryside, its processes, the need to industrialize, um, it will be prudent not to do it from a very compartmentalized point of view. And that's why the, the idea of African Union the East African Union, and quite a number of unions within Africa, gives, gives the, um, the, the stage to enframe, to enframe all these processes and have shared understanding and ideas. Although Kenya might be working on its own end game and Uganda might be working on its own end game, Tanzania might be working on its end game, these platforms give us a, a, a platform to enframe spaces and reframe them with, with, a, with, a, with a target. So if we are targeting climate change, we all re reconfigure our governments, our institutions, our universities, our spaces, our locals to all that one end game. So if you're talking about industrialization, there we are. We are looking at all these processes together. And, and it's in that union then we all achieve this, this one collected goal that we are all looking for. That also adds up to what we all, all have a consolidated future on. And maybe in another 50 years, it will be interesting to see how Africa's future, how European future, how America's future is all integrated to, to one so that we have this systematic, always looking for a target that we are all, all, all um, working towards. And I will say that there was some really positive feedback on the research you did on the countryside, but there was one or two or quite a number who said, leave the countryside alone. You're gonna make the countryside like the city. And for us, we're thinking it's the exact opposite by sort of de De decongesting the city and providing opportunities spread out all over Kenya, which is, has a huge landmass that is available for this and accessible through a fantastic transport network, fantastic financial networks, finance, uh, fantastic connections to um, good infrastructure. It's actually possible. Um, and as I said, in Western Kenya, where the, a lot of the population live, when you go there, it doesn't feel like a city. Everyone is spread out. Everyone is in their own zones, in their own little neighborhoods. Um, so it's about reframing what we think of as the city or what we think of as development, as Linda said. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, I call it the Wakanda principle, which is allowing the West to define 
what we think a, an African city would look like. And I think it's not true. The reality is that if I think of what development is, it is the neighborhood, it is the, it is the village, it is, it is the community with access to urban infrastructure. It is not New York. It is not um, even the way the Nairobi city is coming up. And you can see that and evidence in the way that we move around. So we're not necessarily looking to the West, but we're leapfrogging. We're not waiting for the malls in Nairobi to become empty and then having to replicate. We're saying, you know what, we don't need malls. We need small urban centers. And in fact, in the city right now, most supermarkets are changing how the interior is designed. Right now, everyone is trying to create little villages or like little movable stalls and mm -hmm. recreate the village market experience. Okay, uh, I, I want to uh, relate to this. Uh, there's two questions that really relate to this. Uh, one from Canada and one from Brooklyn, and I want to combine them. Um, the first question is, is from Randa from Toronto. City dwellers are no longer bound to the city by their work and are flocking in large numbers to the countryside. They are disrupting the already existing infrastructures and services that are not meant to serve large populations. How are these emerging societal issues informing the existing countryside? So that is one. A kind of alarm that basically uh, large numbers are moving in, uh, into the countryside. The second question is darker, and it is somebody who is hiding anonymously um, <laughs> from an architect in Brooklyn. And so this dark question is, why do we want to spread humans into places where they will further disrupt ecological corridors? increasing risk of exposure to the migration of viruses from different species and onto humans. That is, uh, much of what has presented was completely antithetical to our understanding of the resiliency that comes with density, the sustainability of urban infrastructure, etc. Can the panelists comment? And so I think it's an important uh, uh, two questions because it, it enables me to clarify the, the aim of this uh, exhibition and of, of this uh, effort. We are definitely not saying that cities are kind of redundant. We are definitely not saying that uh, we should stop living in cities. Uh, what we are saying is that we should understand the countryside much better, understand the potentials and issues of the countryside much better, and particularly, uh, uh, think about the uh, effect on the world if actually half of the population currently inhabiting the countryside would move. So uh, since that is the uh, official tendency, I think we don't have to particularly worry about large numbers that are disrupting the kind of uh, the, the conditions in the countryside. I think <clears throat> large numbers are needed. Uh, there is a lot of uh, countryside which is kind of abandoned. Uh, the first picture that Matthew showed uh, is a kind of almost devastating picture of, you know, a civilization that once was once there and that is no longer there and that needs to, in order to continue, needs uh, kind of human habitation. And yeah, and, and I mean, to also add to that, I think <clears throat> what we have shown and we, we actually commented on was, was it the exact opposite of what is uh, claimed? I think um, whether you choose for the um, half earth principle, let's say the half earth strategy, is that basically you leave at least 50%, and this is not a kind of maximum, this is a kind of minimum, at least 50% of, of nature untouched, which means that, that mankind has to leave, um, uh, let's say the countryside or, or nature. And, and the other um, uh, uh, issue is that I think that um, whether you choose for the shared planet, it means that there are a lot of conditions that actually uh, enable you to, uh, to follow this shared principle, the uh, shared planet principle, which are absolutely everything but the, the current condition uh, continued. It means a much more intelligent uh, way to deal with nature, a much more intelligent way to deal with um, uh, with food uh, 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 production. So I think it's actually the opposite of what um, uh, what the comment tries to um, uh, uh, su suggest here. Um, I think that there's um, maybe another question which is interesting to um, uh, to ask all the panelists. 
And that's uh, maybe in, in very short, like what does the rural in your local context, uh, uh, i.e. where you are, look like in 2030? And this is a question by Stefan uh, in New York, who is actually uh, the kind of organizer of the entire uh, <laughs> seminar. So it's, I think his personal interest. So, um, uh, and you go first, Matthew. What does the rural look like in, the, in 10 years where we are? So I'm actually in a rural community. And um, just to answer a little bit about the, the woman from Toronto, all the projects I've done, the communities have just given the buildings. Yeah, they're, they're, no one's occupying them. So there's, there is you know, a lot of space. And, and the thought that we could overwhelm a system a rural system. I had not thought of that before. That has not been the case in the communities I've worked with. They've actually wanted to have um, more stability. And what happens is actually there's a consolidation. So if two towns um, are losing a population, one town might decide to join schools with the other town. And when that happens, the first school will go down. And that, those are there's three pillars in those communities. The school, the pharmacy and the grocery store. If you start losing any of those, you're gonna start to see migration to the other town. So I don't know if you can overwhelm the systems at the moment in 2020, it doesn't seem, what's the rural gonna look like in 30 years? I'm very much optimistic. Um, this quarantine has had me, I travel all the time. I've been a nomad for the last 10 years working with communities across Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and America. I'm in America now in a small town basically getting work done, um, pop open a little bubble water, and I just walk around this town. It's, it's definitely a pleasing experience. I think that because I can get my work done and because the internet has us all connected, I just don't see that there's going to be many limitations to living in the world. I think it can be a real option. I know that's the counter narrative to what the UN has put together, but it just seems like, um, yeah, it, it's got land, it's got space, you know, it's got a pace to it. If you're enjoying that, I think it can be a really um, great place for people to think about um, living. Thanks, Matthew. Um, Linda and Etta? Um, that's an interesting question you asked there, uh, because pre-corona, we, we would have easily predicted um, what, what, the, what the world would look like, at least our countryside would look like. But after the fact, um, we are getting more because we are used to now working online from the from the urban areas which are quite dense and given our strong sense of home and belonging we are finding most people having the need or or, or um, the opportunity now to go back to the countryside because they can still work online so there's there will be that migration now happening and and that's why I think it's important to bring back um, the, the conversation on, on planning country, countrysides alongside urban areas. So as we're thinking about urbanization, we bring back countryside and regional planning back to the table so that then um, the transition of people back and forth is done in a very systematic way that still keeps uh, our, our forest preserved, preserved, that still keeps our animals um, preserved uh, for, for that sake and, and also keep climate change in check. I think that's what, what I could say about that. And I'll just mention, there's a comment about us going to the countryside to pollute it. I'll just say that actually, the idea is that it's already, people are already living there and we've just not thought about it. We have not planned our towns. In Kenya, the, the, the town that we studied at the University of Nairobi with our students from their third year class is Woi has doubled its population every other year. Basically, it's becoming a little city with no planning and no provision for conservation and ensuring the correct kind of growth. And so for us, it's that this project is not to say, everyone go to the countryside, it's wonderful. It's to say there are people in the countryside, there's development happening in the countryside. Mm -hmm. Can we control the narrative? Can we discuss how to preserve it, how to make it livable and well-being? And it's not that, as I said, it's not that in, in Kenya where people have gone have come to the city and gone back, people haven't left yet. People are still finding out how to come back here. Mm -hmm. And some of them are still staying there. Um, and the countryside is already developing. And the cities are congested. Right mm -hmm. now in Kenya, we have a 2 million housing deficit. So what happens to the 2 million people in the city every yeah, year yeah. who don't have a house? Yeah, yeah. So it's about sort of reframing that. Yeah, and, and if I could just briefly mention here, yeah, undertook 
is it's not about um, emphasizing that people need to move back to the countryside. It's more of an appreciation of this countryside that has existed in anonymity, because we, we don't know what's happening in this. When you zoom in and out of an area of view, you see lots of tracts of land, but there are quite a number of, 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 of processes that are happening in there in anonymity. So it's by understanding them that then we can sit back and say, it's either option one, so shared planet or half planet. So how do we go about this, knowing the processes that underlie, underlie the countryside? Thank you so much. Lenor. So I think in the Netherlands in the next 10 years, we're going to see an acceleration, um, kind of a fast forward of the rural areas, at least in terms of agriculture, um, towards this shared planet um, uh, strategy, basically. I think with the climate of the, the EU's new commitments to things like these farm to fork strategy goals, um, they claim they want to convert um, the area of farming in Europe so that 25% is occupied by organic farming. Um, they're gonna dramatically decrease the amount of pesticides and other agricultural inputs that are being put into systems. So you have that on one hand. On the other hand, you have what we've learned and seen from the corona crisis um, where farm labor is becoming scarce and technologies like robots are being accelerated. Um, so I think combined those factors are gonna move us really quickly towards a, a shared planet kind of um, future. And we, we already see this happening. And when I started my research three years ago, we had, I knew of maybe two farmers in the country who were doing strip cropping, which is that kind of um, transitional middle road technology, something between monoculture and pixel farming. And in those three years, um, we now have, that I know of, about 35 farmers who are doing it actively. They've completely converted their farms um, and a huge number more who have signed up to take courses to learn how to do the practice. Um, and there's a lot of buzz growing around it. So I think from the farmer's perspective, they're willing to try new things. Um, and from the climate, uh, from a lot of different angles, it's gonna drive this kind of fast forward. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that we need to conclude. Uh, I will ask uh, Samir his uh, prognosis for 30 years, uh, for 10 years, 10 years, next 10 years. Yeah, I think 10 years is not that much, but um, in, in that sense, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that, uh, of course, um, um, whatever uh, choice between these two models, the shared planet or, or the, the half Earth is not a kind of silver bullet. What we are probably already seeing and, um, and, and observing is a kind of patchwork that, that, that show a kind of contour of, of both uh, situations uh, happening at the same time, um, but in the end, the only way to um, uh, uh, to sustain our, our our survival, let's say, on uh, on Earth. For for me, the the experience of uh, organizing this uh, exhibition and and therefore experiencing uh, uh, an incredible variety of new conditions. Uh, and, and very surprising conditions uh, was a very deep uh, pleasure and I uh, am particularly kind of struck by how much fun it was, how m many positive messages uh, we encountered and how, m how much willingness to, to experiment, to think, uh, to think uh, about things in a new way and to collaborate. So uh, if that is some uh, kind of process you could extend, that would be my prognosis for the next 10 years. Um, then, yeah, I think then we, we are, we're, we've reached the end of, uh, of this panel discussion. I would like to uh, thank all panelists, uh, Lenora, Linda, Etta, and Matthew uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for being part of this. Uh, UN75 for organizing it, uh, the Guggenheim, um, museum for uh, for their role in the exhibition, also organizing this uh, this talk, um, and of course the audience for sending us their questions. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.